It began as a training club for marksmanship and became one of the most feared and effective lobbying groups in Washington. But just what is the NRA and how did it become so powerful? For NPR, I'm Ron Elving. Welcome to my office hours. Today, the organization has more than 5 million members, and it is active at both the federal and state legislating levels. It lobbies, it raises money, it spends money on campaigns. The power of this organization is legendary, especially the report cards that it issues for legislators and their positions on gun issues. The cards have been credited with the election or the defeat of many a candidate, including many incumbents. And that is how the NRA has been able to anchor the opposition to every major piece of gun legislation for the past 40 years. But how did it get there? The NRA started as an actual rifle association, a marksmanship club, all the way back in 1871, when a couple of Northern Army veterans from the Civil War decided that Northern boys ought to learn to shoot as well as their Southern counterparts knew how to do in the Civil War itself. Many people are surprised to learn today that, for generations, the NRA worked with the government to limit the traffic in guns, especially where, say, ex-convicts or mental patients were involved. Then the NRA again worked with the Congress and the White House on major pieces of gun limitation legislation in the 1930s and in the 1960s. This actually angered much of their rank and file membership, especially in the 1960s as people became concerned about rising crime rates, major flaring riots in major cities, and people were buying guns for their personal protection. In 1975, pressed by these rank and file members, the NRA created its first lobbying arm, the Institute for Legislative Action in Washington, D.C. And here's the turning point from marksmanship to hard-edged political activism. Just two years later, at the 1977 NRA convention in Cincinnati, Ohio, a power struggle that had been going on for years burst into public view as a rebellion broke out on the floor and changed the NRA forever. Now, that Institute for Legislative Action that I mentioned was headed by a Texas lawyer named Harlan Carter. He was an immigration hawk who had been the head of the Border Patrol in the 1950s. And when the NRA leaders tried to rein him in, he organized what was called the Cincinnati Revolt on the floor of that convention in 1977. And he won the floor fight and became the organization's de facto leader. Harlan Carter's new marching orders, which have been in effect basically ever since, were to oppose all forms of gun control in Washington and in the state capitals, and to aggressively lobby for gun owners' rights. Harlan Carter proclaimed that his group would be, quote, so strong and so dedicated that no politician in America, mindful of his political career, would want to challenge our legitimate goals, unquote. Now, this change in mission for the NRA also coincided with a new surge in political money. Decisions made by the Federal Election Commission and later upheld by the Supreme Court and decisions of the court itself made it possible for the NRA to tap a vast reservoir of campaign cash. And thereafter, they were able to fund campaigns and candidates at every level of the political process. This, in turn, gave the group the muscle to move pro-gun legislation and to stop gun control legislation. This is the NRA we know today. This is the gun debate as we know it in the U.S. today. And for the time being, it looks like that's where things will stand. For NPR, I'm Ron Elving. Thanks for coming to my office hours.